Hey, this is James Golf with the Ian Media, and you know the drill at this point. This is one of the most exciting series I've ever done. I studied about angels in three different decades. That's older than some of you are even at your age and watching this. So we want you to just to keep tuning in to the sequel of Angelic Encounters when Jacob's Ladder keeps coming on down because it's going to come down in your life too. And in the past, one of the beloved countries, I believe I've been to 14 times, was Czechoslovakia, today Czech Republic. I made my first visit there right after I had ministered in Germany, and then I went to Zagreb, what is today Croatia, and I was a helper intercessor for my dear friend, Mahesh-Savda. And then we went on to Sarajevo, which today is Bosnia-Herzegovina. And we were there right before the Civil War, the war, a terrible war broke out about six months before. I was being a daytime teacher, an intercessor, and Mahesh was doing the nighttime miracle and healing meetings. And then from there, we ended up, we went to Prague, to Praha, then Czechoslovakia, today Czech Republic. The favor of the Lord was so profound. The hunger of the people, people was so immense. I was invited back the next year to speak at their national congress. Now before me was somewhere around 2,000 people who were new believers, hungry in Jesus, who had just come from out of communism. There was a man who was not able to come to that set of meetings, a pastor, who lived in the northern part of the nation. His name was Avald Rufke. And I want to tell you a, one of my favorite stories from this man's life. I have this authenticated. I have it on tape with interpreters. And I have had him sign off that what I'm about to tell you is totally 100% accurate. Avold was not able to come to the meetings in Prague. He lived in the northern part of the country, and he had just been released from the hospital in Sweden. And he had, so he had just gotten home. I didn't know this at the time, but our next assignment was to go to his city, which is called Liberitz in Northern Czech Republic. I had three friends that were with me, Bill Greenman, David Dryling, and David Fitzpatrick. And that day they went out on a tour. And I stayed back in the cold, dark, dingy, what had been a communist building where people all lived, tall, dark building. And I stayed back that day to be before the Lord. I tried praying all day. Seemed terribly unsuccessful. And as they say, God's slow, but he always shows up on time. And at the very end of the afternoon, finally, I felt the Lord's presence come and he spoke to me. And he said to me, tonight, you're going to meet a man who has had a heavenly visitation. And he has spent three days with me. And I have told him ten things that are to come. And this man will be used to restore the Moravian watch of the Lord. That's what I heard. My friends get back, and now it's time to go. Go to the meeting. It's held in some facility. It was not a church. I'm not introduced to any leadership. I'm not introduced to this supposed pastor. I don't know what he looks like. There's no worship, and it's cold turkey. You get up, and you just start talking. Again, communism had just lifted. I love these people, but they looked like bumps on a log, still frozen. 
and so I'm working with my interpreter, and I don't feel like I'm getting very far, making much progress. So I decided, I think I better pull out my trump card. So I'm now doing my strong praying in the Spirit, but as quietly as I can, hoping the Holy Spirit will direct my thoughts, words, and now actions. So I stopped. I turned and I pointed to a man sitting over in the bleachers. And I said to him, Sir, the Lord indicates to me that you are a man who has recently had a heavenly visitation. She spent three days with God in heaven. And he told you ten things that are to come and that you will be used to restore the Moravian watch of the Lord. They stopped the meeting right then. That was as far as we got. They asked me if I knew who that man was and I said no. And he was now introduced to me as the senior pastor of the Moravian church. They sent around a piece of paper right then and there for people, for men and women, to re-sign up for the hourly place as watchmen on the walls for the restoring of that ancient 17 and 1800s watch of the Lord that Hearn Hut, its name, the Lord's watch was named for. Well, needless to say, I was quite intrigued on who are you, and he was quite intrigued with, well, who are you? And so the next day, I had an interview with this man. Sure enough, he had been a pastor of a Moravian church in a time of communism. He only had, I think, about 13 people, if I remember correctly, in the church at the time. Communism lives, and this man came under an apostolic authority and he started going out preaching the gospel and people started getting saved and filled with the spirit and signs and wonders happening and, 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 and just a, a strong congregation grew, grew quickly and that was who I ended up I was speaking with. But he also was running very hard and he had gone to Sweden and was ministering and he literally has a heart attack to such a degree that he falls into a coma and he is put in the hospital in Sweden and he's lying in this coma in the hospital bed. They, act, they were very, very concerned. Actually, the doctors, you know, there wasn't signs, you know, like of life. And his wife came and was sitting in the chair in his hospital room, praying for her husband and the father of their children. And his best friend's name was Peter. And Peter was his associate pastor. And as Peter said it, he carried with him the prayers of the saints. And that Peter was the point of the spear, and they were the shaft. And he carried the prayers of the saints with him to the hospital room in Sweden. He gets there. He's standing now over this body lying, comatose, in the hospital bed. And now Peter, a fervent man in God, was at a loss. And he had no words of intelligible language that he could speak. And he is now begins to weep over his best friend's Avald's body lying in that bed. Avald, though, had escaped for three days. For three days, Avald had been in heaven. Avald had a tour of heaven. When Avald was there, he was not aware that he was a husband, a father, a pastor, and his work was not yet complete. He was just enjoying God and the sights. At one point in time, and I'll only tell you one of the ten things that Avald was shown right now. At one point in time, Avald, it was like as though standing almost like between heaven and earth. Sounds like an Ezekiel experience. 
and he's looking down upon the earth and he sees dark clouds all over Central Europe. And then white lights were going up and down, up and down, up and down through the white clouds, breaking up the dark clouds. Avald turned to his interpreter, his guide, the Holy Spirit. And Avald said, what is this? And his guide, his interpreter said to Avald, oh, those dark clouds, that was, those are the territorial spirits of darkness that have been resting over Central Europe. And then Evald goes again, he says, well, what are those white lights? And the guide, the Holy Spirit says, oh, those are the angels. Evald says, well, what are they doing? He says, they are breaking up the powers of darkness. And then Evald asked one more question in this, in this encounter. And he says, how does this happen? That the angels are released to break up the powers of darkness. And the interpreter guide of the Holy Spirit said, this too happens in answer to the prayers of the saints. Angels, heaven's army is released into an earth realm in response to our invitation called prayer. And the ladder <laughs> keeps on coming on down. I have a friend named Sean Boltz. Some of you perhaps have heard of this wonderful prophetic brother. He was one of my students, like some of you are now. He was one of my students some years ago when I was in Kansas City and I worked with the Grace Training Center there and Sean was, took several of my classes. I want to read to you an encounter from this quality young man. And it's recorded in his book, Keys to Heaven's Economy, an Angelic Visitation from the Minister of Finance. Restoring desolate inheritances, Colossians 2, 2 and 3. May they be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All the sun's intensity seemed to blaze through my bedroom window on the morning of July 5th, 2001. The sun's rising was so brilliant that I turned the other way to avoid it. But as I rolled over, Mirrors reflected the light straight into my eyes. Blinded from both sides, I sat up, squinted, looked down at the edge of my bed. And what I saw stunned me. A man stood there watching me. I studied him for a few seconds. And I realized that he was not a human being, but an angel who carried the very atmosphere of heaven. And not just any angel, but one of heaven's great angelic beings. I had never had an experience quite like this, and the fear of the Lord gripped my heart. Although this angel carried an air of nobility, he was dressed rather humbly in a brown robe that looked like burlap. It was covered with pockets. Beneath the robe was another garment that appeared translucent and alive, much like living light. The angel was approximately six feet tall with brown hair and piercing hazel eyes, which I wanted to avoid looking into because I was frightened by the intensity of the love and the authority they conveyed. At the same time, I couldn't seem to take away my gaze. We were totally eye-locked. His face radiated both compassion and authority. And authority. Suddenly, I understood why John the Beloved had become confused and worshiped an angel who had appeared to him, Revelations 19.10, because angels foreshadow God's radiant and illuminous appearance, the voice of the Lord. Before I could say anything, the Lord's audible voice filled the room, introducing the angel standing before me. Welcome, the minister of finance of the kingdom. The sound was both like that of a trumpet 
and a voice in one. Waves of the Lord's presence rippled through me. Later I found out that a young boy in the next room had been awakened and terrified by this audible voice of God. After the Lord's announcement, he continued speaking to me internally through my spirit, giving me greater understanding about this angel and his high-ranking position. Immediately I knew that this angel had command over all the finances and the resources that heavenly authority calls forth from earth. These resources have only one purpose, to bring Jesus his full reward and inheritance in our age. What a holy and noble occupation this angel had. No wonder I felt God's glory in the room as the angel stood there. Along this time that we'll have together, I'm going to recite to you biblical accounts. I'm going to take us into church history accounts from different persuasions and backgrounds, both Protestant, Orthodox, and Catholic. I'm going to take us into contemporary experiences, some like what I'm telling you now. I'm going to try to take us into the lives of some of the prophets today, of what they experience. And my wife and I will also unzip some of our history and unfold our heart like I told you. The lesson, the encounter when the ladder came down again in the bedroom in our house when our sons were young. Well, <laughs> we are definitely not alone. We are not alone. Have you ever just wanted to be able to peer, look, gaze, into this heavenly dimension? I believe it is much closer. He is much closer. I received a dream some years ago where I was sitting around a table with some men and they were discussing and a, a soon coming assignment that someone needed to study about the ministry and function of angels. And one by one around this table, one man after another said, well, that's not my assignment. Next one, no, it's not for me. Went all the way around this entire oval, oval table type desk where there were two people that were left in this dream. One was a man named Mike Bickle, who is the director of the International House of Prayer in Kansas City, and I worked with him during that period of time. It was he and I, and he looks at me in this dream, and I say in the dream, surprisingly, I said, I'll do it. I woke up from that dream, wondering what that was all about, and so I set on a course to study the ministry and function of angels. I realized that actually 10 years before that, in the early 1980s, I had already studied the 300 scriptures in the Bible about the ministry and function of angels. So now for my second time, I dove into the Word of God to study about the ministry and function of angels. He, God, draws near. And at times he uses these heavenly messengers to come to our aid. I feel that the more and the more as the last days and the end times unfold, these accounts that I'm telling and we're going to live together will be more profuse, more powerful, and we are going to be joined where heaven's army is released into an earth realm and we will be strengthened by heaven. 
Well, how many angels are there? I don't know. I know we are not alone. From the book Beyond Space, a population of the angelic world. The exact number of the angels that inhabit the heavenly Jerusalem has not yet been revealed. To try to determine their number must appear like an idle question, since man has not been able to determine the exact number of the stars. The vast number of the stars, each one a sun in itself, is awe-inspiring and quite beyond our powers of comprehension. Until now, no known mechanical device has been able to even remotely suggest the magnitude of this visible universe. What must be the magnitude, the splendor, and the glory of the invisible, immutable, angelic part of the universe? What are the vastness of the spirit world and the number of these splendors that decorate the heavenly home, the house of God, and that the house of man, our earth, is surrounded by such an infamy of stars? Who has ever been able to count all the men and the women who have inhabited this earth from the beginning to the present time? For without divine revelation, we would be unable to know not only the number of angels, but even whether they exist at all. It is then on a data of revelation that we must depend in order to give some vague idea of the transcending vastness of the spirit world. These data actually suggest a multitude of angels that is beyond all our power of comprehension. Describing the throne of God surrounded by heavenly spirits, the prophet Daniel is at a loss. In determining the number of these heavenly beings are good angels. Thousands of thousands minister to him, and 10,000 times a, a hundred thousand stood before him. Bible commentators tell us that the figures here given by Daniel do not express a definite number. They serve to convey the idea of a multitude that is far beyond the power of human language to express, more than figures that are really hyperbol hyperbolical expressions for an innumerable multitude of angels standing around the throne of God. The throne of the Most High surrounded by his host of myriads and myriads of angels is a picture occurring frequently in the scriptures in the Old Testament. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the army of heaven standing by him at the right hand and on the left. All inspiring is the vision described by prophet Isaiah. I saw the Lord sitting on the throne high and elevated and his train filled the temple and upon it stood the seraphim. The one had six wings, the other had six wings and with two they covered his face and with two they covered his feet and with two they flew. And they cried to one another and said, holy, holy is the Lord God all of hosts and all the earth is full of his glory. Saint John the Evangelist in his apocalypse describes the vision of many thousands of angels around his throne of God. And beheld, and I beheld, I be heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the numbers of them was thousands upon thousands. One of the greatest classical books from obviously a Protestant perspective is that of Billy Graham, his book, God's Secret Agents. Angels, God's Secret Agents. The empire of angels is vast as God's creation. If you believe in the Bible, you'll believe in their ministry. They crisscross the Old and the New Testaments, being mentioned directly or indirectly nearly 300 times. Some biblical scholars believe that angels can be numbered potentially in the millions, since Hebrews 12, speaks of an innumerable myriads, a great but infinite number, company of angels. As to their number, David recorded 20,000 coursing through the skyways of the stars. Even with his limited vision, he impressively notes, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. Psalm 68, verse 17. Matthew Henry says of this passage, angels are the chariots of God, his chariots of war, which he makes use of his of, of against his enemies, his chariots of conveyance, which he sends for his friends, as he did for Elijah, his chariots of state, in the midst of which he shows his glory and power. They are vast, numerous, vastly numerous, 20,000, even thousands multiplied. 10,000 angels came down on Mount Sinai to confirm the holy presence of God as the, as the Lord gave the law to Moses, Deuteronomy 33, verse 2. An earthquake shook the mountain. 
Moses was held in speech bound wonder at, at this mighty cataclysm attended by the visitation of heavenly beings. Furthermore, in the New Testament, John tells us of having seen 10,000 times 10,000 angels ministering to the Lamb of God in the throne room of the universe, Revelations 5.11. The book of Revelation also says that the armies, armies of angels will appear with Jesus at the battle of Armageddon when God's foes gather for their final defeat. Paul in 2 Thessalonians says, the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Chapter 1, verse 7. We just... We're not alone. We pray, kingdom come, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray that prayer, we're welcoming heaven's host to come and to join us, to aid us, to strengthen us. The hymns in church history have also been used to reveal this dimension. The song written, All Hell the Power of Jesus' Name. The text by Edward Peronet. All hell the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. In verse 4, let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball, to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. To him all majesty ascribe, and crown him Lord of all. And then in verse 6, Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song, and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song, and crown him Lord of all. And from a stanza that in most contemporary music worship based churches don't know these songs and ways today but having grown up in the Methodist church and having in my youth been the young man who stood up in the choir loft balcony that oversaw the, the people when they would come in, and I would sing an a cappella. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. One of the songs that you would also, stanzas that you would sing, is called the doxology. And it goes, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son and the Holy Ghost. And so, we welcome the Angelos, the messengers. We welcome the winds, and we welcome the fires of God. And we say, as they have said through ages past, we need heaven's help. 
We are the ones who need strengthened. And we call forth once again for Jacob's ladder to come down into the earth realm once again. So I speak that you must be careful because in these next weeks, you too might entertain some strangers. But you might become so awakened that you will be aware. So I just lift this time, this class, and I ask for heaven's help and heaven's impartation and the fear of the Lord and a new level of worship and a new level of the ministering spirits to be released in our time and in our day when Jacob's ladder comes down again in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I'm so excited that you've tuned in to EN Media and be a part of this angelic encounters. I am believing that you're going to have an invasion of the heavenly kind in your own life. And remember, if you'd like to learn more, get our book, Angelic Encounters, co-written by Michael Ann and I. And there's a four CD album that complements it as well, a whole DVD set. So if you've watched this beginning, you're going to get the entire thing. And remember, then there's the study guide that goes with all of them. And there's a big album that goes with it, a CD, and you can do this in your home or in your cell group or in your own training centers. So I just want to thank you for being a part with us, with EN Media, with Angelic Encounters, when Jacob's Ladder keeps on coming on down.